So my friends, it's a look in the dark, chapter 6, called Face to Face, and it's part 3, the last part of chapter 6. You remember Carol had followed Stanhurst down to the car park by the river, photographed him in the car driving away, and she got the registration plate of his BMW. Feeling contented, Carol said quietly, a brave good day's work, Caramillas. She allowed herself this mental pat on the back, remembering her old maths teacher who had encouraged her to give herself honest self-congratulation when it was appropriate. Returning to the seat by the river, now occupied by a young courting couple, she was a bit embarrassed at having to interrupt their kissing in order to ask for her bag under the seat. Sorry, I left it there earlier. The couple would soon kiss again and, and, and probably would not even remember the pause in their passion. Carol followed the towpath back along the river and treated herself to an ice cream. She had to translate slider into wafer before she got what she was seeking. The difference between English English and Irish English never ceased to amaze her. As she stood on the bridge between Windsor and Eton watching the boats on the river below, she knew that she had plenty of time before meeting Danny at Slough Station. But her tour of Windsor's shops led her to only buy Danny some chocolate eclairs. She really couldn't wait to see him. She wanted to hear how he had managed with Stanhurst, tell him how she coped herself, but most of all she just wanted to be with him. She wasn't sure what the next move was, but she knew Danny would be pleased to have a car number. He'd expressed a desire for that. Carol liked puzzles, and certainly that was what they were confronted by. Later on, Carol would have plenty of scope to solve a puzzle, but right now she was looking to Danny for the next step. As Carol was driving back to Slough, Danny was sitting on the train thinking about how this day connected him to Carol and how it placed him in relation to the rest of the world. Inside he had a good feeling, like when he came first in the cross country at school, or like the way he felt when he saw his name in print for the first time. He felt good because they were making a mark, fighting back, opening a war on ruthless exploiters of the creatures humans share the planet with. Somehow, the fact that there was risk made it all the more satisfying. But he did have some concern about Carol, lest something had gone wrong. All the same, he knew his canny wife. He knew if that if she'd been born a sparrowhawk, then hunting would have come easily to her. Also, he knew that her upbringing in Ireland, and especially her time in Belfast amid the Troubles, had taught her a thing or two that she could never have learned in Somerset. Just thinking about his wife's personality made him smile, almost made him laugh, regardless of the other passengers sitting close by. He thought back to something Carol had said to him on their second date. He'd taken her rowing on the river in Salisbury, and it had been so appropriate for her to say it then. When he'd been rowing badly against the flow of the water, she had never really known how much her words had affected him, and until then he'd just floated along, mostly going where other people's lives took him like a piece of drift, driftwood being washed about by passing craft of all different shapes and sizes. You know, Danny, she said, we humans need to fly, but not like thistle down, blown by the wind and perhaps growing if we land in the right place by chance alone. We have to choose our place and choose it well, because then we have to fight for it. We must defy the wind and the tide and be what we will regardless of the rest. He could recall that scene very clearly. Carol laying back in the rowing boat, the curve in the river behind her, the weeping willows dressed in summer green, and the little grebe calling from somewhere behind him. He could feel the heat and see it sunburst in upon the shimmering water. He could hear Carol's serene, Tyrone tones speaking those words. If he had to define a time, that was when he fell in love with Carol. That afternoon in the boat, and those words had such a profound effect on him giving him a sense of personal purpose. Danny was stirred from his happy memories as the train stuttered into Slough Station. He rose from his seat and as he joined the Multicultural Society on the platform, he checked his pocket for the present he brought for Carol. He was relieved to see the Ford Escort waiting for him. His favourite voice called, Well, hello Danny boy, can I give you a lift someplace? My mother told me not to take lifts with strange girls and you look pretty strange to me. Will you get in this car before I get a parking ticket? As Danny got in the car, she reached across and kissed him, then a little too speedily, though very smoothly, she got into the line of traffic. Good day at work, husband dear. 
I think so, but it all depends on you really. Well, come on, why the self-satisfied expression? Well, Captain, I can report a dark blue BMW something or other with the registration of a W066 con. She could, took her eyes off the traffic to look at Danny for a moment and then added, I even have a photograph. Well done, Carol, I knew you'd do it. I want another kiss. That's fine, sir, but a little difficult in this congestion. Can I keep it for later? What was that number again? W06 con. Why are you laughing? William of Normandy, you know 1066. Yes, I did learn that you occupants of this small island off the Irish coast failed to repel an invasion. Now, had you sought help from our boys? Stanners, registration, carolies, nuts about William the Conqueror. How boring is that? Have a chocolate eclair, they're in the glove compartment. I didn't like him. He looks like a thug posing as a gentleman. He wouldn't be the ideal neighbour. A black widow spider might be more friendly, but we may have started to name him Carol. Carol wanted to know what they did next, but her husband said it could wait until they ate. They were ahead of the rush hour and were soon well up the M4 motorway westbound. Danny directed Carol off the motorway and onto the road for Marlborough. Arriving in Marlborough with Bob Dylan's Highway 61 keeping the tired couple, tired couple awake, Danny suggested that Carol park in the wide Marlborough Main Street, and soon the Greens were in a restaurant enjoying a meal. Danny Green, I love you. Carol took Danny's hand across the table. Mr Green would like to reciprocate your feelings. They felt the food was extra good, but they were on a high, and everything tastes better then. So tell me, Commander Bond, if you know I would handle it okay, why the anxious faces you came out of Slough Station? Afraid I'd run off with the Major? No, but I was concerned he might have run off with you. He's dangerous. Bit risky taking a photo. Are you sure he didn't see you do that? Danny was reassured by Carol's confidence that her shot from the hip went unnoticed. So, King Harold, how do you propose to get revenge for good old Wessex? That's where we get some help from the men in blue, well, more specifically from your brother-in-law. Dave, how? Well, we really need a traffic cop. How much do you trust Dave? Completely. Dave is sound. Yeah, I think so, and he provides the next line of inquiry. At this point, Danny passed a little package across the table. Inside, Carol found a silver necklace that delighted her. The one sparkling and delicate flower hanging from its lowest point sprinkled the light in a dozen directions. Just to say thank you for your help. We must go back to Windsor sometime. Did you see that castle? Aye. Did you see that river? Oh, damn, this is gorgeous. She held the present up to her neck and looked at him with those penetrating jewels like green eyes. So are you, my Irish friend. Danny drove the car across the downs from Benkhampton roundabout to devises, and Carol leaned back in her seat in contemplative mood, wondering if it all mattered. She was thinking out the way battles had been fought on these very hills. Lives were given and taken, and people of stout heart had struggled in desperation for what they thought to be right. Now, as they all lay in the dust of the ground, what had become of their causes? Above the darkening foreboding hills, the distant stars sent small packets of light. Carol knew that some of these stars were so large that the sun and all the space between it and the earth could be swallowed up inside them. If one tiny planet died, would it really mean anything? How much less does it matter about this bird, this bat, or that flower? Does the loss of the dodo really amount to anything in universal terms? Carol wasn't sure. She was tired, though. Right now it seemed to her that the people who left a permanent mark were named Attila or Adolf. True, most people knew that Jesus had taught people to treat others as they'd like to be treated, but how many even tried to do it? Drifting into one of those uneasy sleeps that come to the tired in a car, she dreamt about pebbles landing in ponds and the ripples dying away and everything returning to normal. She awoke with a start as Danny drew to a halt at a pedestrian crossing which was showing him a red light. Nobody was there to cross but it was certain that someone had pressed the button and then crossed without waiting. Yet still in that deserted street, the law required that they stop and wait for the green light. But the pebble is still there, Carol said it quite loud. Sorry, love, what pebble? You know, Danny, a teacher can affect eternity, and 
never really knows where his influence stops. That's true, I guess. Well, the American historian Henry Adams said something like that. Carol, how do you remember all these quotes? Ignoring her husband's question, only being half conscious of what he said, she continued, Maybe it's a bit like that. Us fighting Stannis, I mean. It could seem like striking a match to light the universe, but a match can start a fire, sterilise a needle, or briefly light a path. Hmm. You're in a serious mood, Carol. Anyway, we've started this and we'll finish it, right? Right. They listened to the news on BBC Radio 4 and Carol expressed relief that it had been a quiet day in Northern Ireland. The missing man in Derry was sadly still missing, but there had been nothing by way of shootings, bombings and riots. Drawing near to Froome, they were elated when a large dog fox ran across the road, the hunter, not the hunted. They agreed as they arrived outside their home that it was too late to phone their favourite traffic cop that night. they would be a have to wait until the morning. Carol was soon snuggled up to her husband and sleeping peaceful, peacefully, but restless Danny Green lay listening to her breathing while he prayed for patience. So that's the end of chapter 3. Where does it go from here? The registration number is certainly going to help them, isn't it? Hope it's making sense, my friends. It is interesting, isn't it, to think about whether what we do makes a difference. Of course we know it does. Many people do just drift through life. But it's good to make our lives count for the things that are really important, isn't it? Hope you continue to listen. And thank you for listening so far. All the very best to you, my friends. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.